the hour. Senator J.D. Vance is with us. Senator, Good to see you, man. you know, I, I, it was funny. When I first interviewed you at the RNC, we knew each other, but we didn't know each other well. Of course. And I was supposed to have you for like a 10 minute interview. I, I think you, I kept you there like 30 minutes. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I hope you're not doing anything for the next half yeah. hour. You're welcome to stay. I don't know if I can stay that long tonight. And as I was watching you tonight, I felt like you really got a chance to introduce yourself to the American people. And I felt it was extraordinarily effective because now that I've gotten to know you, that's sure. the person that I know. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I just wanted to talk about issues, right? I saw this as an opportunity to get 90 minutes with the American people. It's an unbelievable opportunity for a person who wants to be the next vice president. And you should just make it as much as possible about substance. And you know, one of the things I, I tried to do, Sean, obviously, is criticize Kamala Harris's record, but also remind the American people that Donald Trump is not the caricature that Kamala Harris and the media have made him out to be, that he was an incredibly effective president for four years in the Oval Office. And he actually solved problems, right? I think most most Americans, Democrats, Republicans, people in the middle, they're sick of Congress being like a high-class debating society. They actually want their elected leaders to do something to solve the country's problems. Donald Trump did that more than any person I've, I, you know, sort of observed in my, you know, 40 years of being on this earth. And it was such a good opportunity for me to just make that point to the American people. We had low inflation. Things were going well. The world was more peaceful. And actually, Sean, it's an easier argument to make tonight. I hate to say it because of the incredible tragedy unfolding in Israel, which what looks increasingly like it could become a broader regional conflict. Like when, when the world is going to crap, and it looks increasingly more violent. You want steady, proven leadership. That's Donald Trump, not Kamala Harris, the person who has sort of broken the entire world. And I just tried to make that point as much as possible, man. Just make it about substance and let the American people make up their mind. One of the things is I was watching the 181 ballistic missiles being fired from Iran into into Israel, and I'm so thankful they got most of them down, but they're yeah. now really fighting a forefront war. And in, I just know in the back of my mind that there is this radical anti-Israel, anti-Semitic even mm -hmm. wing within the Democratic Party sure. that I just believe that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls don't want to alienate. And unfortunately, evil is evil. Yep. And Iran, ha Hezbollah, Hamas, they have in their charter, they've stated over and over, they want to wipe Israel yep. off the map. We hear it in the halls of Congress, college campuses. Right. This is a serious, their, their very existence is at risk here. No, that's exactly right. And of course, not just their existence, but America's national security here. I mean, if Iran becomes a regional hegemon, it will have a nuclear weapon the next week. Right. That will seriously endanger the United States of America because the Iran have shown they're clearly not rational. But you think about this, this, this happened, Sean, because of confused policy from American leadership. We ask ourselves, like, how did it get to the point where Iran is launching 200 ICBMs at America's most important regional ally? And the answer is because they don't actually know where Kamala Harris stands. Now, you talk about how they've cozied up to sort of this weird pro-Hamas wing within their own party. Well, they're doing that, of course, because of political reasons, but it shows that, that confusion that comes out of that policy invites a lot of aggression, invites a lot of bad guys doing terrible things, and it also, Sean, motivates a lot of really stupid policy. 200 ICBMs, that's not cheap. Iran has a lot of other weapons. How did they fund it? Two reasons, Sean. Number one, Kamala Harris went to war against the American energy sector that radically increased the amount of oil revenue the Iranian regime was benefiting from. Number two, they unfroze $100 billion of Iranian assets. They're effectively handing these guys pallets of cash. The Iranians are buying weapons. And real leadership would be to say, we screwed up. We got something wrong. Let's go in another. Let's do what Donald Trump did. But they just can't do that because of the but political they turned reasons. Turn a blind eye to the sanctions. The sanctions made they, they literally made Iran rich, and that that allows them to fund these proxy yes. wars. That's Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, the Houthi rebels, and now Iran directly firing into mm -hmm. Israel. And what should America's response be here? Well, look, I think it's tough, Sean, because we don't have a president that we can actually trust. I don't even know who the president of the United States is. And that's one thing we didn't actually get into the debate that I really wanted to hammer Kamala Harris on is that for three and a half years, America has been saddled with a president of the United States who can't do the job. And the reason is because Kamala Harris lied and said he was up to the job of president. And of course he wasn't. And now we're in this, you know, we've got this terrible crisis in Appalachia, these terrible floods, a lot 
of people affected. We've got this regional war breaking out in the Middle East, and we don't have effective American leadership. Look, I think what our response is, is fundamentally, this is Israel's security, and they have to make the decision about how they're best going to protect their own security. And they need the support of their American allies, not Joe Biden, as confused as he is, standing behind them, effectively promising that he's going to punish them if they dare defend their own sovereignty and their own security. Israel is actually very good at this stuff. It's one of the great things about Israel as an ally, unlike, frankly, a lot of so-called American allies, is they have a viable military. They have a viable intelligence service. They're going to make their own decision about how to protect their sovereignty. I think our role here, support our friends and also get back to some common sense foreign and economic policies so that we can be strong enough to respond to the next national security challenge. Let me ask you, um, you kept bringing up a point that I felt was very effective in this debate, and that is she's been vice president nearly four years. Yeah. And, you know, on day one, I'm going to fix inflation. On day one, I'm going to fix the border. On day one, I'm going to do this and that. And, you know, and Walls kept bringing up the issue of immigration. Yes. You brought up the 90-some-odd executive orders that they, they bragged about. That's right. But also, for three years, they said the border is secure, and Harris wants to decriminalize illegal immigration, yep. offer free food, housing, health care, education, sex change operations, yep. amnesty on top of it. And we have all these unvetted illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Now, dozens of Americans have been murdered. I had the parents of two of them on last night, Rachel Morin's mom yeah. and Jocelyn Nungary. Many Americans have been raped, including children. Yep. We have other victims of violent crime, unvetted, harassed by the illegals. It's awful. It's okay. atrocious. The cost is through the roof. And I think America understands it, but you also brought up other aspects, how it impacts education and the economy yeah. and housing and the high yeah. cost of housing. Look, man, so much of our problem is actually due to Kamala Harris's open border. You take 25 million illegal aliens, so take a small community. Let's say you've got a school district of four or 5,000 kids. Now, all of a sudden, you add 1,000 kids who can't speak English, through no fault of their own, of course. Yeah. But of course, the American education system, the education for our kids suffers in the process. Hospital wait times, so a point I actually didn't get to make uh, this evening, but hospital wait times have gotten longer and longer. Why? Because a lot of illegal aliens go to the hospital emergency room to get medical care. Well, that means American citizens aren't able to be seen by a doctor quickly. Housing is, I think, actually the biggest issue. A major driver of housing costs is that you have millions of foreigners who are illegally in the country who are competing with Americans for scarce homes. That's supply and demand and shoots the cost of housing through the roof. And this is why I talk about substance. My goal was to talk about substance tonight because I think a lot of Americans sort of intuitively get this country's leadership has failed it. And I just try to explain as much as possible. Here's why Kamala Harris has been a failure. Here's why Donald Trump has been a success. And here's how we're going to clean up the mess that she created. Let me, let me ask one question as you're on the stage. Tim Wall seemed very nervous tonight. Did, now, I, I kind of walked away with the impression, I guess maybe I felt, maybe this is the reason he doesn't do interviews. He seemed, well, did it come across as nervous to you? Honestly, I didn't notice it, man. Adrenaline's going so much. I was yeah. nervous. I mean, hell, like I do a lot of these interviews, Sean, but I was nervous. It's the biggest stage of my life. So yeah. I didn't focus so much on his yeah. demeanor. I just tried to focus on what he was saying. And look, he, to be fair to Tim Walls, he had a very tough job. And that is to defend the policies of Kamala Harris. This is a great that moment have driven, to bring that up. Yeah, which he did have a tough job. He, he does. And, and look, it's Kamala Harris has done this. Her policy failures have made food, housing, energy unaffordable. We just need a change in this country. We need to get back to the common sense leadership of Donald Trump. I'm not surprised that Tim couldn't defend that record. Who could? If you put me on that debate stage, I mean, you clearly think I did a good job. I hope that I did a good job. But if you asked me to defend Kamala Harris's record, I'd melt into a puddle because there is no defending what she's done the last three and a half years. Let's talk about the number one issue in just about every poll for most Americans is the economy. Yeah. I mean, we have record high inflation. When Donald Trump left office with 1.4 percent. It's up 20 plus percent higher. That's right. Everybody knows because I go shopping every week myself. Every store we go to, every item we buy costs sure. more. Uh, if you want to buy a house, maybe if you want to change homes, you're not going to give up your 2.9 or 3 or 3.5 three or 4 percent exactly mortgage right. for a 7 percent 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Yeah. This, this is, these are the bread and butter issues of peace and prosperity drive elections. Mm -hmm. Well, we got war in Europe, war in the Middle East, and we've got an economy that is struggling. 
and wide open borders that has made our country not safe. Yeah, that's exactly right, Sean. I mean, look, you know I grew up in a working class family. Sometimes we did okay. Sometimes times were really tough. And I, I can't help but think about this through the eyes of a family that's struggling to make ends meet, where people are sort of looking at the credit card bills, they're looking at the groceries, they're looking at the medical expenses, and they're saying, we can maybe afford two of these three things, but we can't afford all three. Right. And I just want Americans, I, I want, you know, if you're struggling in this country and you're looking to the future, I want you to look to the future from a place of hope and optimism. I want you to believe the American dream is still possible, because I really do believe it's still possible, Sean, but man, only if we get the policies that actually make sense for the American people. I mean, I, you know, the thing that I've learned most that the last eight weeks, man, I've had such an insight into this country, and it's so amazing. People come up and ask me how I'm doing, and sometimes I'm talking about people who are struggling in a very big way, and it's sort of like, you know, I kind of had this like eureka moment of if all of these American citizens are so concerned about the guy running for vice president when they themselves can't afford groceries, there is a generosity of spirit in this country that is so amazing. We need a leader who actually matches up with that generosity of spirit, a leader who Who's fit to lead the greatest nation in the world? We don't have it now. I think we're about to have it starting on November 5th. You know, it was interesting because I remember Kamala had said about the high price of energy. Now, I would think it matters to the people of Pennsylvania and your state of Ohio yeah. on the issue of fracking. Of course. Um, and she doesn't want offshore drilling. One of the things that I feel with 35 days left and early voting starting, she has not answered why she co-sponsored the Green New Deal, $93 trillion, yes, right? That to me is Marxism. Yeah. Uh, why she co-sponsored government-run health care, Medicare for all, no private health insurance. That's right. You know, how, how, do you, how do you justify sex change operations paid for by taxpayers, amnesty when people don't respect our laws, border sovereignty, or defund, dismantle the police, or I did wish you brought this up at the end, you know, she, was, she tweeted out a bail fund four days after a police That's precinct right. was burned to the ground, yeah. and then said, they're not going to stop writing, shouldn't stop writing, we're not going to stop writing. Yeah. In my defense, Sean, there's so much to whack Kamala Harris about with her record that there, you only <laughs> had 90 minutes. Critical. I didn't I have four it. hours. Yeah. But no, it, it, look, yeah. it, it, you're absolutely right here that her policies, it's not just that she did these things. She, in some cases, went out and bragged about opening the border. Yeah. She bragged about how she wanted to divert resources away from police officers. She bragged about the Green News scam, which, of course, is one of the main drivers of energy and food prices. She bragged about this stuff. It happened, and Americans have suffered from it. Now, you, you made a good point. She hasn't answered for any of this. Well, Sean, in her defense, she hasn't answered for anything because she refuses but to sit down they for don't, interviews. They don't do press conferences well, or and, interviews and for this crying Okay, like, honestly, By the way, I will offer Kamala and Tim Walls a whole week's worth of shows yeah. if they come. No, Sean, I, I legitimately believe, no kidding, that you would be a much more fair interviewer of Kamala Harris than, for example, what like Dana fair. Bash was with me. Right. But you go on Dana Bash's show, you go on Sean Hannity, you go wherever you can, because if you want to be the vice president of, of the United States, you ought to earn it. You ought to get out there and talk to the American people. And I think it's the most scandalous part of her, of her entire campaign is that she's running from a basement, hiding from the very people that she wants to lead, while you have a contrast of Donald Trump, who not only was a successful president once, but is so eager to get out there and make his case to the American people that he's doing multiple rallies a day, multiple interviews with, with news leaders. That is the kind of guy with the energy that you need to actually run this country. You know, one of the things I, I think you look for in a debate is tone, pitch, cadence, intelligence. Does that person have the ability to step in, God forbid, if you have to become the president of the United States? Um, at the end of the day, I felt this was a, maybe for people that had a caricature of you. You mentioned sure. one of Donald Trump. Um, I think that came across tonight. Um, you had a good time? I had a lot of fun, man. And yeah, look, On a scale of 1 to 10, how nervous were you? <laughs> like an 11. <laughs> By the way, it is a big moment. There's only, you know, it's, uh, 70 million people or so watching. Exactly. It's a, it's a very big moment. And, and yeah, I, I just I, I saw it as an opportunity to look directly at the American people and communicate the ways in which I you thought we could do better. Yell, right? <laughs> there was one person ahead of you, if I'm not mistaken. No, there were a lot of people ahead of me, including my wife. I, I think she was, wife. Yeah. she was number she one. She was way ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, but no, man, I, I just, it's such a cool opportunity yeah. to get to talk to the American people 
to get to make your case to them, to get to remind them that like Kamala Harris's policies have been a failure. And I, and I tried as much as possible to make it about policy because I think that's where Donald Trump is such a better candidate, but most importantly, a much better go president the record? than these guys. The, uh, oh my look God, at the record. Sean, the it's... record low unemployment for every demographic, African-Americans, Hispanic-Americans, Asian-Americans, women in the rising workplace. Rising take-home pay yeah. in the biggest and most significant acceleration in 40 yeah. years in this country. I mean, you go back, there's a chart, Sean, that I was obsessed with in college, yeah. where you look at the wages of working class people, black, brown, white, whatever their skin color. And it basically kind of stagnates for like 30 years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this thing happens where it shoots right up. And that's the presidency of Donald J. Trump. It's an amazing record to run on. And not only were there wages yeah. of all these working people of every skin color going up, but then inflation was between one and a half and two percent the entire time that he was president. It's the best economic record of any president, at least since World War II. And man, it's not just like, look, I, I, yeah, I love, I'm running with a guy, I love to brag on Donald Trump's economic record people were happier and healthier. Families like mine could afford the essentials because he was a good president. We gotta get back to it. You know, last question, and uh, I now read the book and watched the movie. Because when I first- started You hadn't read the book. It, I hadn't read the book. I only had watched the movie. And when you think of where you came from, and I, and I thought, you know, my four grandparents came from Ireland legally, and they were poor. My parents both grew up very poor. Yeah. And my mom was a prison guard. She worked 16 hours her whole life. My dad, a family court probation guy, waiter. I learned to work and be financially independent when I was young. Yep. Nothing compared Amazing though, story. Nothing compared to your life. And, and I saw at the convention, and your mom was there, and what that meant to you, that she had turned Results. her life around. Yeah. And I just think it's very a redemption story that America really can appreciate but yeah well, so I'm um, now you came from there to here not a bad not a bad story you just need to we need to get to the final chapter that, that's exactly right man. 35 and, and, days and can you believe it 35 days I can't believe it but I think we're in a sprint we're gonna work as hard as we can for every single poll Look, man, I feel amazing about the polls. Yeah. Um, if you look at the pollsters who've been most accurate, mm -hmm. actually were in a better place than we were in 2016. And of course, Donald By Trump won the election 20, in 2016. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I just, I feel very good about it. I think the energy is great. You mentioned my mom. I'm just probably watching now. I love you, mom. I'm proud of you. I She's been clean mom. and sober, by the mom. way, <laughs> for for, t for yeah. almost 10 years now. Yeah, and, and thank it's, God. It's, it's, I, I just. And the American dream is an American dream of second chances, right? If people, yeah, they fall off the horse, but they keep on getting back on. And I think that we need leadership that makes those second chances possible. That is what the presidency of Donald Trump represents. It's not just yeah. about red team versus blue team. Like, yeah, I want to beat the Democrats. And it'll be fun on November 5th to beat the Democrats. If Donald Trump is the next president, the people that I care most about are going to have better lives. And that is what this is you know all what about. 2016 was about the forgotten men who Yes. Men. You know, I mentioned my grandparents parents and my parents and I feel I stand on their shoulders and I know you feel you stand on the shoulders of course. and that's the dream of every American in my view and that's that's the shining city yeah. on a hill that Reagan talked about right um, so let's get around the table and see what what folks thought yeah I, I thought it was interesting the senator Vance pointed time and again you heard it in his close that vice president Harris has been in office for three and a half years. Uh, when it came to weak policy on Iran, the first question is dealing with that Iranian missile strike into Israel, on immigration and border issues, on inflation, coming back again and again to that. Governor Walz did appear nervous at first, but seemed to find his stride on the abortion stretch of questions where he talked about personal stories of women seeking abortions in restrictive states. But he really had a tough moment when he was asked about why he said he was in Hong Kong for the Tiananmen Square protest when he was actually really in Nebraska. He said sometimes he just says things and he's a knucklehead uh, talking about things. Again, no questions about China, no questions about Ukraine. And there were some you know, questions about fact-checking and whether it was fair and balanced across the way. Uh, here with us tonight, Dana Perino, Harold Ford Jr., Laura Ingram, Jesse Waters, Britt Hume joins us remotely. Britt, uh, your thoughts uh, coming out of this debate? Well, the moderators were obnoxious um, and made it feel like three-on-one on Vance, and Vance was just fine. He seems to have been, his skills as a debater and a speaker seem to have been honed to some extent by just these several months on the campaign trail. 
Uh, and for one so young, um, he seemed, in terms of his knowledge of policy, to run rings around poor Governor Walls, who I think did not have a very great night. As you say, Brett, he got better as the night wore on. But if you're rating this debate on points, it wasn't close. Uh, Vance had a good night. Laura, what's your take? Well, for those who question Trump's choice of Vance uh, as his vice presidential running mate, I think those doubts should have been put to rest tonight. I don't think, and I've been, with my eighth presidential campaign, I think I covered, I don't think I've ever seen a Republican so deftly maneuver what was smug and arrogant bias on the part of those moderators. Almost every question was designed to make Republicans look bad, slanting Trump's views on child care. And, and yet Vance seemed to take it all in stride. And he really, I think with most questions, really showed his humanity and also his knowledge of the issues. I don't think he could have done better under the circumstances, and I think that is very reassuring to the public who thought he was perhaps an ogre or anti-woman or didn't like kids or some strange um, concoction of the of the uh, stereotype that they were selling. Harold, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I, I was as I was listening to some of the issues and, and really what I was looking for at the very beginning. Was he likable? Was were the candidates likable and optimistic? I think they they both were. I think the uh, senator. Vance probably had a little better edge there because all the things that have been said about him were they smart uh, and knowledgeable. There's no doubt both were, but at the beginning it seemed that uh, Governor Walsh was a little rattled, uh, and, and and Senator Vance came out stronger and certainly uh, sure of himself, which helped him well. Were they relatable? I thought both of them. One of the more remarkable things is they seemed to like each other. They shook hands. They talked about things they agreed on, on child care and other things. I agree with you. Abortion was where he really got his stride going. And finally, can you see both of them as president? I think, you know, Senator Vance did himself a good job, and he's a young guy. Waltz is a little older, uh, and both of them seem to like, had some confidence in him. Uh, but there's no question on the economy and on immigration. I think that the Republicans still have their advantage. And on January 6th, an abortion and health care, uh, Republicans have it on the other, excuse me, and Democrats have it on that. You know, uh, Dana, obviously the Trump ban side is trying to reach out to improve those numbers with women. On the other side, for Harris and Waltz, they need to improve their numbers with men. And you could feel both of them trying to do that at times tonight. Did they succeed? Well, Vance did and Waltz did not. You can understand why the Democrats spent the entire week trying to lower expectations for Waltz. The only problem is for Democrats, they underperformed because the expectations should have been even lower than that. For any Republican or independent who is concerned about Vance, I actually think on the other side, it's so many Democrats tonight saying, why did Kamala Harris not pick Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, because I think that might have been a different debate. Uh, Vance made a concerted effort to talk directly to swing voters, and I don't think it was just women, but certainly uh, men who might have been on the fence. I don't think he, I don't know what Waltz did um, on that point for men. I do think that you're going to see a lot of the media say, why can't Vance just say Trump didn't win in 2020? Right. And they're going to try to hang that on him. And I, I, I think there will not be another debate, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kamala Harris doesn't want that to be the last word on a national stage. 35 days left, and that could have been the last debate. Uh... Last night's moderators promised us they would take a step back on the fact-checking and let the VP candidates correct each other, but it only took about 25 minutes for us to get this heated moment. Thank you, Governor. And just to clarify for our viewers, Springfield, Ohio, does have a large number of Haitian migrants who have legal status, temporary protected. Thank Margaret, the, the, the rules were that the you economy, guys weren't going to fact check. And since you're fact checking me, I think it's important to say what's actually going on. So there's an application called the CBP One app, where you can go on as an illegal migrant, apply for asylum or apply for parole and be granted legal status at the wave of a Kamala Harris open border wand. Thank Our you, Senator, for leadership. describing the legal and process. And Bush, we and have Kamala so Harris much to get to, that Senator. Pathway. Those we laws have, so have been much on the books since 1990. Thank you, gentlemen. The, the, the we want to have... app has not been on the books since 1990. It's something that Kamala <laughs> Harris created for Gentlemen, you're, the audience can't hear you because your mics are cut. No, oh, the audience heard him. Joe Conch is a Fox News contributor, and he joins me now. Joe, I guess CBS is no fact-checking by the moderator's rule. Only applies if candidates stick to CBS's narratives around things like Springfield and immigration. Joe? Well, butter my button. Call me a biscuit. I can't believe we saw bias from the CBS moderators last night, Todd. I mean, Arbert Hume 
during the post-debate coverage, called the moderators, quote, obnoxious, unquote, and that was the perfect word to apply here. Laura Ingram called the fact checks smug and arrogant bias, and, and they're both right. This was journalistic malfeasance. CBS promised the moderators, to your point, were not going to fact check, and then when they did, of course, three times, all the fact checks were on J.D. Vance and none on Tim Walls. But to his credit, as you just showed, J.D. Vance pushed back and fact-checked the fact-check, yet didn't lose his cool. So for all keeping score at home right now, over two debates, eight fact-checks for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance combined during ABC and CBS's debates respectively, uh, zero fact-checks of Kamala Harris and Tim Walls on the same two networks, in case you're wondering about the whole smug and arrogant bias thing, Todd. Yeah, I'm shocked. I'm shocked to hear that. But you know what? We both like hockey. You know what this was? This was a one-on-three shorthanded situation, and J.D. Vance scored all the goals each time. Very impressive by him. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on this. ABC anchor Lindsay Davis, if that name sounds familiar, she did one of the debates, you know, the uh, Harris uh, Trump one, compares Tim Walz's mm -hmm. debate performance to Joe Biden's. Listen. It kind of reminded me of the June 27th debate uh, when Kamala Harris that night said of Joe Biden, it was a slow start, but a strong finish. And that's how I felt that Tim Walls kind of uh, did tonight, you know, to use uh, Tim Walls' own words. I mean, a lot about this debate tonight was was weird. There were uncomfortable, cringy moments. Uncomfortable and cringy, Joe. You heard similar sentiments on CNN and other left wing media outlets. So my question to you, now that the entire country, not just the Fox News viewer, has seen Tim Walls exposed, will that have any impact on the Harris Walls ticket and the election in general? Well, the ticket will, will stay intact, certainly. But in the end, I think what we're probably finding is many who are supporting the, the Harris Walls ticket have buyer's remorse this morning because they had that one inch punt, or at least Kamala Harris did, when she could choose any running mate and she had Josh Shapiro out there, a Pennsylvania governor in a blue state or a or purple state, I should say, that is at 65% approval. You win Pennsylvania, you probably win this election. She had Shapiro right there and she went for Tim Walls instead, which brings nothing to the ticket. And then as we saw from that debate last night, uh, obviously was outclassed by J.D. Vance, where this was a masterclass, by the way. Uh, the senator came across as likable, uh, empathetic. He was knowledgeable. He was confident. While Tim Walls, who often, especially during the first half of that debate, appeared nervous, overwhelmed, not confident, and rehearsed. So that that's where we're at at this point. I don't know if this moves the needle that much, and I'll leave it here, Todd, but J.D. Vance, his favorables went up something like 25 points in some uh, polls I saw after this debate. So the Trump-Vance ticket benefited far more from this night, watched by 60 million people, than the Tim Walls and Kamala Harris ticket. And you know what else this debate did? It put to rest all that J.D. Vance's weird nonsense coming weird, from left. Yeah. Because if that's weird, I'll sign up for weird every day of the week. Tim Waltz and J.D. Vance went head-to-head -head in their first ever vice presidential debate, broadcast live on CBS. The debate was praised for being much more substantive than the presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump just last month. With a much deeper dive into policy issues rather than personal jabs, which characterised the Harris-Trump debate. But it was ultimately J.D. Vance's confidence in debating, knowledge of policy and slick presentation that won him the night. Even leftist media like CNN were forced to admit Tim Waltz lost the debate. I think there was a clear lack of preparation and execution here I on think that he, I think actually it's the opposite. I think he had too much preparation. Maybe. Yeah. He had so many lines that he was clearly trying to say yeah. that he didn't listen and said when, when uh, J.D. Vance said one of the many, many things he um, really hit Kamala Harris on, not Tim Walls, but Kamala Harris, he didn't respond because he clearly had things in his mind. I think the lack of interviews that he has done with national media with local media it showed he needed more reps yeah no I, I i agree i mean uh jd vance is uh much more uh experienced at this at public speaking at defending himself at pivoting msnbc's rachel maddow was less generous with her praise admitting that vance was slicker but waltz had a stronger grasp on policy um a cordial debate between these two men um I wouldn't describe them as evenly matched because they are so different. 
um, so different in style and so different on substance. Um, very interested to hear from the spin room, to hear from all of my colleagues here, to get to all of the analysis that we're going to get to. I think the big picture takeaway from this is that one of these candidates is much slicker than the other, is a much more practiced kind of professional debate style speaker, and the other candidate won. Um, there was one bad moment for Tim Walls in this debate where he got mixed up and embarrassed in answering a question about exactly what month he had been in China in relation to the Tiananmen Square protest. But then on guns, on January 6th, on Obamacare, on the economy, on blaming everything on the border, back again on health care, on abortion, um, on every issue on substance, um, J.D. Vance was very polished and very slick, and Tim Walls uh, beat him on all the substantive points. At least that was my take on it. J.D. Vance made the unprecedented move of pushing back against the fact-checking of the moderators, which is what many berated Donald Trump for failing to do during his presidential debate. Many commentators applauded this, with this commentator saying, just now, CBS moderators fact-checked J.D. Vance and refused to let him fully respond and eventually cut his mic. But this MSNBC host had a different take, accusing J.D. Vance of mansplaining the all-female moderators. Like muting power. Yeah. And I actually yeah. think if you're a woman, that might be the, the worst moment J.D. Vance had because he was going to mansplain right over that mute button. Um, he was, uh, and again, I don't pretend to know how everyone will react to this. I think that a lot of women um, in positions of authority that should command respect just by virtue of that dynamic will see themselves and some do the disrespect of them and talked over. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there was a moment like that with, with the vice presidential in the Harris. Uh, Pence debate. The ABC was also forced to admit Vance's victory after a Democrat strategist said Vance performed better on the night. One Democratic strategist in a battleground state was actually very critical of Walls' performance tonight, telling us Vance is much better at this than Walls. I don't think it matters much, and there's good moments for both sides, but if I have a frustration, is that I don't know what Walls' strategy was tonight. He said his advice to him would have been, you have one job. Trump goad Trump into debating the VP again, let it rip. And more of the leftist media seem to be turning on the Democrats, with CNN's Jake Tapper calling out the Harris Waltz campaign for their lack of public facing interviews. I've interviewed you more this week than I've interviewed the entire Democratic ticket this year, but that's a separate issue. Okay, but the Democratic ticket has not been the Democratic ticket for very long. In front so of, all so do, make all them all, all three of them. So make it all three. MSNBC's Jen Psaki also came out against Waltz, saying Vance seemed reasonable and Waltz was missing magic. Look, I, I felt that if you're sitting at home and you were watching and you were not fact-checking and you weren't familiar with what J.D. Vance had said previously or what Donald Trump stood for, he seemed at many moments to be reasonable. Yeah. Um, and that was clearly a change in tone. And I know you all were talking about the strategic shift there. That was interesting to watch. Watching Tim Walls, what I thought about was when he emerged onto the scene, we all probably interviewed him five times during Veep Stakes, he would propelled himself single-handedly into Veep Stakes, right? He became the running mate because of their chemistry, but also because he was so effective at connecting people authentic, authentically and organically on television. He's been absent. I think that's a huge mistake mm -hmm. um, for, to hold him back and not put him out there. Meaning he and hasn't been on the media for a while. He hasn't been out in the yeah. media for a while. He's been absent. I do, do think that's a, a missed opportunity. But tonight, I felt like he was spending a lot of time in the first half or two thirds proving he read the briefing materials. ABC's Lindsay Davis slammed Waltz with a major insult, likening his performance to Joe Biden's debate performance against Trump. It kind of reminded me of the June 27th debate uh, when Kamala Harris that night said of Joe Biden, it was a slow start, but a strong finish. And that's how I felt that Tim Walls kind of uh, did tonight, you know, to use uh, Tim Walls' own words. I mean, a lot about this debate tonight was was weird. There were uncomfortable, cringy moments. But overall, I think my takeaway was uh, something that Reince Priebus said on the outset, which was that uh, J.D. Vance needed to come away as that humble, likable guy from Hillbilly Elegy. It seemed like he did uh, perhaps get some points in that area. But not everyone on the left was ready to admit defeat. MSNBC's Nicole Wallace had an epic meltdown over J.D. Vance. 
It's the audacity. I, 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 yeah. I agree with you that we're in year nine and no one knows how to cover the audacity. Mm -hmm. The audacity is it, is it someone should have said, stop it, stop, stop. <laughs> Are you effing kidding me? And they should have, they should have dropped that F bomb, right? move on. Nora? Let's talk about the state of democracy, the top issue for Americans after the economy and inflation. After the 2020 election, President Trump's campaign and others filed 62 lawsuits contesting the results. Judges, including those appointed by President Trump and other Republican presidents, looked at the evidence and said there was no widespread fraud. The governors of every state in the nation Republicans and Democrats certified the 2020 election results and sent a legal slate of electors to Congress for January 6th. Senator Vance, you have said you would not have certified the last presidential election and would have asked the states to submit alternative electors. That has been called unconstitutional and illegal. Would you again seek to challenge this year's election results even if every governor certifies the results. I'll give you two minutes. Well, Nora, first of all, I think that we're focused on the future. We need to figure out how to solve the inflation crisis caused by Kamala Harris's policies, make housing affordable, make groceries affordable, and that's what we're focused on. But I want to answer your question because you did ask it. Look, what President Trump has said is that there were problems in 2020, and my own belief is that we should fight about those issues, debate those issues peacefully in the public square, and that's all I've said, and that's all that Donald Trump has said. Remember, he said that on January the 6th, the protesters ought to protest peacefully. And on January the 20th, what happened? Joe Biden became the president, Donald Trump left the White House, and now, of course, unfortunately, we have all of the negative policies that have come from the Harris-Biden administration. I believe that we actually do have a threat to democracy in this country, but unfortunately, it's not the threat to democracy that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz want to talk about. It is the threat of censorship. It's Americans casting aside lifelong friendships because of disagreements over politics. It's big technology companies silencing their fellow citizens. And it's Kamala Harris saying that rather than debate and persuade her fellow Americans, she'd like to censor people who engage in misinformation. I think that is a much bigger threat to democracy than anything that we've seen in this country in the last four years, in the last 40 years. Now, I'm really proud, especially given that I was raised by two lifelong blue collar Democrats, to have the endorsement of Bobby Kennedy Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard, lifelong leaders in the Democratic coalition. And of course, they don't agree with me and Donald Trump on every issue. We don't have to agree on every issue, but we're united behind a basic American First Amendment principle that we ought to debate our differences. We ought to argue about them. We ought to try to persuade our fellow Americans. Kamala Harris is engaged in censorship at an industrial scale. She did it during COVID. She's done it over a number of other issues. And that, to me, is a much bigger threat to democracy than what Donald Donald Trump said when he said that protesters should peacefully protest on January the 6th. Governor? Moonpeak's the place where cards come to life. Show off your fave shared memories with an easily crafted card that they're one. Well, I've enjoyed tonight's debate, and I think there was a lot of commonality here, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to misspeaking on things, and I think I might have with, uh, with the senator. Me, but me there's, too, man. There's one. there's one, though, that this, this one is troubling to me, and I say that because I, I think we need to tell the story. Donald Trump refused to acknowledge this, and the fact is, is that I don't think we can be the frog in the pot and let the boiling water go up. He was very clear. I mean, he lost this election, and he said he didn't. 140 police officers were beaten at the Capitol that day, some with the American flag, several later died. And it wasn't just in there. In Minnesota, a group gathered on the state capitol grounds in St. Paul and said, we're marching to the governor's residence and there may be casualties. The only person there was my son and his dog who was rushed out crying by state police. That issue and Mike Pence standing there as they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. Mike Pence made the right decision. So Senator, it was adjudicated over and over and over. I worked with kids long enough to know, and I said as a football coach, sometimes you really want to win, but the democracy is bigger than winning an election. 
you shake hands and then you try and do everything you can to help the other side win. That's, that's what was at stake here. Now, the thing I'm most concerned about is the idea that imprisoning your, your political opponents, already laying the groundwork for people not accepting this. And a president's words matter. A president's words matter. People hear that. So I think this issue of settling our differences at the ballot box, shaking hands when we lose, being honest about it, but to deny what happened on January 6th, the first time in American history that a president or anyone tried to overturn a fair election and the peaceful transfer of power. And here we are four years later in the same boat. I will tell you this, that when this is over, we need to shake hands this election and the winner needs to be the winner. This has got to stop. It's tearing our country apart. Margaret. Senator Vance, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, look, Tim, uh, first of all, it's really rich for Democratic leaders to say that Donald Trump is a unique threat to democracy when he peacefully gave over power on January the 20th, as we have done for 250 years in this country. We are going to shake hands after this debate and after this election. And of course, I hope that we win and I think we're going to win. But if Tim Walz is the next vice president, he'll have my prayers, he'll have my best wishes and he'll have my help whenever he, he, he wants it. But we have to remember that for years in this country, Democrats protested the results of elections. Hillary Clinton in 2016 said that Donald Trump had the election stolen by Vladimir Putin because the Russians bought like $500,000 worth of Facebook ads. This has been going on for a long time. And if we want to say that we need to respect the results of the election, I'm on board. But if we want to say, as Tim Waltz is saying, that this is just a problem that Republicans have had, I don't buy that. Governor. January 6 was not Facebook ads. And, and I think a revisionist history on this. Look, I, I don't understand how we got to this point. But the issue was that happened. Donald Trump, can you do it? And all of us say there's no place for this. It has massive repercussions. This idea that there's censorship to stop people from doing threatening to kill someone, threatening to do something. That's not that's not censorship. Censorship is book banning. We've seen that. We've seen that brought up. I just think for everyone tonight, and, and I, I'm going to thank Senator Vance, I think this is the conversation they want to hear. And I think there's a lot of agreement, but this is one that we are miles apart on. This was a threat to our democracy in a way that we had not seen. And it manifested itself because of Donald Trump's inability to say. He is still saying he didn't lose the election. I would just ask that. Did he lose the 2020 election? Tim, I'm focused on the future. Did Kamala Harris censor Americans from speaking their mind in the wake of the 2020 COVID situation? That is, a damning, to, that is a damning non-answer. Has she? It's a damning non-answer for you to not talk about censorship. Obviously, Donald Trump and I think that there were problems in 2020. We've talked about it. I'm happy to talk about it further. But you guys attack us for not believing in democracy. The most sacred right under the United States democracy is the First Amendment. You yourself have said there's no First Amendment right to misinformation. Kamala Harris wants to oh, use the power of speech. government and big tech to silence people from speaking their minds. That is a threat to democracy that will long outlive this present political moment. I would like Democrats and Republicans to both reject censorship. Let's persuade one another. Let's argue about ideas and then let's come together afterwards. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's that's the test. That's the Supreme Court test. Tim, fire in a crowded theater. You guys wanted to kick people off of Facebook for saying that toddlers shouldn't Senator, wear masks. Senator, the governor does that's have the floor. Fire in a crowded theater. That is criticizing the policies of the government, which is the right of every American. Senator, the governor does have the floor for one minute to Please. respond to you. Yeah. Well, I don't run Facebook. What I do know is, is I see a candidate out there who refused. And now again, and this I'm pretty shocked by this. He lost the election. This is not a debate. It's not it, it, it's not anything anywhere other than in Donald Trump's world. Because look, when Mike Pence made that decision to certify that election, that's why Mike Pence isn't on this stage. What I'm concerned about is where is the firewall with Donald Trump? Where is the firewall if he knows he could do anything, including taking an election and his vice president's not going to stand to it. That's what we're asking you, America. Will you stand up? Will you keep your oath of office 
even if the president doesn't. And I think Kamala Harris would agree. She wouldn't have picked me if she didn't think I would do that, because of course that's what we would do. So America, I think you've got a really clear choice on this election of who's going to honor that democracy and who's going to honor Donald Trump. Governor, your time is up. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We will be right back.